And so um, let me tell you a little bit about myself so you know my context. Um, my training was in fine art, uh, primarily in conceptual art and sculpture. And then I was a toy designer, and then I got into technology, watching kids play with technology more. And uh, my orientation when I got to Google was about making technologies that could bring people together. And so it was a real surprise to me when I got to Google X about four years ago, having no idea what to expect. And I saw people wearing computers in front of their faces, and I thought, oh no, you know, what's, what's going on here? This doesn't look like something that's going to bring people together. Um, this look like, looks like it might do the opposite. And what do I do? And I did some soul searching, and I thought to myself, well, there's some amazingly smart people here. They've built some great things in the past. Google has a good reputation, and so maybe, maybe there's more to it than meets the eye. And maybe I can bring something to this project. So I decided to give it a few months and see how it went. And so anyway, now it's four, four years later. I'll tell you why I stuck around. Um, and I thought I'd start with a little philosophy because it took me a while to understand why Google wanted to work on a project like Glass and now the watches. And I think that these two quotes sum up a lot for me what it's about. Um, Larry says, technology should do the hard work. You should have a chance to live, have a good life, and get on with it. And you sort of see that in products like Google Search, where they're trying to get you the information you need and then get you off the page as far as fast as possible so you can get your answer and then uh, do what you want to do. And uh, Sergey would say things like, Com computing needs to be more comfortable. And on face value, these seem like different statements. One is about form and the other one is about function. But at the heart, they're really saying the same thing. They're saying that computing should get out of the way. It should start to disappear. Kind of what KK was talking about. How do we make it dis disappear into the background and become invisible so that we can live our lives and it can bring us some benefit without being in between us. Um, and the idea is that like it will never compete. Technology will never compete with the world. The world is beautiful. You know, it's full of sunsets and children and puppies and how could you possibly be more interesting than that? Uh, and so you shouldn't try to be. Um, and so one of the things we say on the design team is that the world is the experience not the technology. When we're designing a user experience, how do we bring the user into the world more richly and more deeply rather than taking them out of it? And uh, you see that idea come up into different ways of glass and the watch that we have today. So for instance, glass is set off into the side. It's not in the middle. And when we show things on the screen, we use a minimum amount of light. Uh, we have a transparent display, so most of our designs are black on the screen because black lets the world through, it's the absence of light. And when we do show you the time or show you a voice prompt, we do it with the thinnest weight font we can. And we show it for the minimum amount of time to be useful. And when you can get technology to a point where it can be very immediate and almost automatic for people, you can bring the benefits of photographing your son as you swing him around on the back lawn without getting in the way of that moment of you know hearing him laugh and seeing him smile. So that's what it means when the world is the experience. That's how we're trying to get there. So that's not where we started. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to go back in time uh, about you know four years um, and tell the story through uh, the story of a cyclist. So I picked up cycling down on the peninsula because it's a really nice place to ride your bike. And there's a lot of great roads there. And it turns out that there's a lot of great things that you can do with your phone while you're cycling, but they're almost impossible to do. And the reason they're almost impossible to do is because you have to take your hand off the handlebar, your eyes off the road, you have to touch a grid of apps. And this all just takes much too much time and much too much concentration. And in retrospect, this is what we were trying to do with glass in the early days. We were putting the screen right in front of you, in front of your face, blocking the road, showing you a grid of apps, and making you choose among one, choose some content, take an action on that content, and finally you could do something. And in retrospect, we were making a common mistake which is to take the old computing paradigm and try and fit it into the new, uh, the new experience. And, you know, this never works. You know, there's always new constraints and new opportunities provided by the new platform, the new form factor. And you've seen this mistake happen on some of the smartwatches that are out there today, taking the grid of app icons from the phone and putting a grid on the watch. And this doesn't really take very good advantage of what a watch can do compared to a smartphone. And so we've been asking the question, like, what else could a watch be? And, uh, you know, here we go. <laughs> so this is a really early prototype that one of my colleagues did, thinking about how could information come to you instead of you having to go to it. 
And so this is an example that we call internally micro-interactions. This is a, a word that we got from academia from someone who was working on wearables and said, if you make it faster, you make it better. And let me talk a little bit about what that is. Remember how I said glasses up and off to the side? It's just like your rearview mirror, conceptually. You don't want to block the windshield. That's where the important stuff is happening. That's where life is happening. You want to provide support. You want to provide support that's in a reliable location and that's very glanceable. It's got the right information at the right time. And it just takes half a second to get it. And after you've gotten it, you can get your, back, your eyes back on the road. This is what we're trying to do with wearables. We're trying to make them glanceable. And what does this look like in software? When you're getting biking directions, for the most part it's off. When you need to do something new, the screen will turn on. It will tell you about the place that you're in and the time that you're in. It will tell you, whisper in your ear, turn right at 100 feet, and then show you a picture of turning right on that street so that you don't have to take your eyes off the road for very long. And when you start to design software for wearables, it's always a process of removing, kind of like KK was saying, like how do you keep taking stuff away? And we're certainly not yet at the point where he has gotten in, in some of his films, but we're going through that process. So here's two designs for a messaging interface for the watch, and they both, at first glance, like, look like they could work pretty well, but it turns out the one on the right is twice as good, and the reason it's twice as good is because it has half as many things on the screen to look at. And so if you do a, a human factors test and you look at how people glance at these different designs, you notice that it takes them about 900 milliseconds to look at the one on the right versus 1800 milliseconds to look at the one on the left. And why do we care about 0.9 seconds? Uh, we care about 0.9 seconds because when you're running and this is shaking on your wrist, you can't even read the one on the left. And we've actually thought about like putting these into our emulators for the software so that software engineers and designers can start to understand, hey, um, this thing is not the same as sitting in front of your computer or even holding your phone still in front of you. It needs to be much simpler, um, much more to the point. And so there's a couple ways we get simpler and to the point. I'll tell you about a couple of the tricks we've figured out so far um, on this journey to making computing more invisible. The first one is voice. And I want to start just with a thought experiment. So imagine you're the designer of the software for a minute. As a software designer, you have to ask yourself, when the user picks up the phone and talks to me, what are they going to ask for? What are they going to want? And how do I get it to them as directly as possible? Again, back to the cyclist. How might a messaging interface be much more direct and to the point than something like using email or, or even uh, SMS on your phone could be? And so a lot of what we try and do is we try and design the software to be more like the way you would talk to people. So in Glass, you can say, okay, Glass, send a message to Jane Williams. It's fairly colloquial language. It's specific enough so you can tell the difference between talking to Glass versus actually talking to Jane. Hmm. And we show a nice big picture of Jane on the screen after you say her name so that you can remember who she is and think about why you care about her. Hey, Jane, great to see you today. And after you've spoken those words, it just goes away. There's another trick we use, which we call context. And so context means a lot of things. I want to tell you what it means to me. Imagine another thought experiment here, that you're a surgeon. And you reach out your hand without looking, and your assistant gives you the perfect tool that you need for that exact moment in the operation that you're conducting. Context tries to get to that point of software giving you the exact information or the exact tool at the time that you need it, predicting your next action, predicting your next need. And so how can this possibly work? And so the reason that it can work better than it has in the past is because all of these mobile devices that we carry, whether it's glass or a watch or the phone in your pocket, have a myriad of sensors. And users may share, choose to share that sensor information with software and services so that it can, it can provide contextual cues. So people may share location, they might share the time, their calendar invites, their identity with you. The activity that they're doing can be sensed automatically using accelerometers, whether you're biking or walking or running. And nearby devices can be sensed automatically. Things like heart rate sensors on a watch can tell you about somebody's activity level and their likely cognitive load at that time. And so this allows us to make a transition from apps as we use them today to how we might use them in the future. So today, when you're going running, you might pull out your phone and... There we go. 
start your activity tracking app, go into the mode that you want, then switch to your music player. Start the music in the background, and get it going. And then go back to your running app. And this isn't bad, but it takes about eight steps in about 30 seconds if you're really good at it. It's a bit too long. Why couldn't it happen automatically? Your phone likely knows, or your watch might know, that you go for a run every Sunday morning, and it can figure out that you're starting to run, that your heart rate is elevated. It might figure out that you plugged headphones into your phone to listen to music. And so it can automatically start that music that you were listening to last time, and automatically start the running app with the goal that you always use every Sunday. You as the runner don't have to do anything. You just start running, and all the software figures out what you need in that time and place. So some, some more hypothetical examples. Imagine you're on a ski slope in the morning, and it's icy. The software can know that you're at the resort, and it can show you which lifts are open and which ones are groomed. Another hypothetical example, you're in the airport, you're swiping through cards, and your airline sends you a card telling you where your frequent flyer miles are at. Or you're at a conference, like today, and the social network that you're in tells you about the friends that you haven't seen for a long time that are here. Or let's say that you've signed up, uh, you've subscribed to a gummy bear feed on Pinterest, and you're in a new town walking around, and you're going next to a gummy bear shop. Pinterest might send you some information saying, hey, that shop you're interested in is right next to you right now. Maybe you want to check it out. And so there's a bunch of hypothetical examples, not that hard to imagine, but I can tell you some real ones too, because through the Explorer program, there's been a lot of uh, people trying to understand how to make wearables more about the here and the now. One of the ones I like is Field Trip, which might tell you as you're walking around the hills of San Francisco, if you're interested in history, it might show you historic information about the sites that you're looking at right now. LinksFit is an app for athletes, almost like a coach, that can figure out when you're doing sit-ups, when you're doing push-ups, track you using motion sensors on glass, and give you encouragement and feedback in your ear, talking to you, telling you how to do that workout better as you do it. There's new basketballs that have sensors in them that can sense how you throw them in the motion through the air and software now that can give you feedback, helping you have a better shot. So if you can't have a coach with you right there, you can get some of that information from a piece of software that just pops up when you need it because it knows that you're playing hoops right now. And golf software that can do similar things, swing by here using an instrument, a golf club with an accelerometer in it, that knows how you're swinging through the air and can give you a bunch of relevant information, not only about your swing, but about the course that you're at. How far is it to that next hole? What might the wind be doing right now that would influence how you want to choose your clubs? So these are a lot of examples showing how software can use location and other kinds of sensors to provide micro-interactions for people, making many of the decisions automatically so that we, as users of this technology, don't have to tell it every single thing to do every time to make the, make the process much simpler for us. And so I think that if this happens successfully, it could actually be a big deal. Because if you think about the way that we use our phones today, you might get a buzz in your pocket and pull out your phone to see who it is, and maybe it's a text from a friend, but you notice you have four other notifications, and so you open up your phone and you start looking at them, and soon enough you're looking at Facebook and checking out the friend feed and stuff like that, and you're lost in the phone, and you're not in the world anymore. And all of these distractions have taken you out of the world, out of the experience that is so much richer in many ways than the things that live behind that piece of glass. And so the hope for wearables and for micro-interactions is that by making those moments much shorter, those distractions much shorter, and letting people get their action done, their tasks completed as quickly as possible, you can get back in the moment. And what we've seen over and over again designing software for glass is that the faster you can get people uh, to complete the task that you've given them, the more successful your software will be. They'll use it more. And so this is maybe a big deal because when people in Silicon Valley evaluate their software today, mostly they're looking at engagement. How long can I get somebody to look at my page? How many ads can I get in front of them? But what I'm saying here is that we need to do the opposite. We need to look at how quickly can you get the, the, the project done for the person? How quickly can you get them in and out? And the thing that's going to be the success of your app is that people are going to use it over and over again because it's giving them the right thing at the right time. And it's going to allow them to be more connected to the people around them not just to the technology that they have with them. 
And so I want to close with what I think is, for me, the most encouraging aspects of glass, which is really about people. So I said in the beginning that I was worried at the beginning of this project that glass would get in between people. And there's some nice evidence that it's actually doing the opposite, that things like the watch, things like glass, are actually bringing people together. There's very simple things like messaging, which you saw a little bit of, or like photo sharing, or communication, which you can imagine as just a small step from where we're at today. And that there's some other stuff that's more transformative. And I want to just tell you two stories. The first one is a story from Tim Poole, who's a reporter for Vice Magazine. And about a year and a half ago, Tim was in the streets in Istanbul, and there were riots in the street. And he wanted to bring people to the riots. He wanted to uh, project that experience out to the world through a streaming uh, internet service like he'd done before. And he's been doing this for a long time, with cameras on his shoulder or with a cell phone. And this time he was using glass, and he said the thing that was different is that when he went up to talk to people, they weren't talking to his phone or to his camera, they were talking to him. The technology was getting out of the way enough that they weren't paying attention to it. They were just paying attention to him and having a much more authentic conversation. And that's important because it gets all of us who aren't in Istanbul a greater sense of empathy with the people who are there. This is a more authentic conversation. And it's that empathy that's really at the heart of art, which is my foundation. It's like, how do you share an emotion? How do you share a feeling? across space or time. And so I think these examples of citizen journalism start to show how wearables, when they start to disappear, uh, can help to do that. And there's other examples that are close to my heart. I used to work on technologies for family to be closer. And I love seeing stories like this, where a granddaughter who can't be there for her grandmother's birthday can at least be there in spirit and see what's happening through her aunt's eyes, watching her blow out 88 candles on a birthday cake. And so, why wearables? What is it about wearables that makes all of this maybe possible, maybe a good idea? I think that there's a metaphor that I came across along the way, which points to a history. The history of these glasses, they started out, and I don't mean the electronic part, I just mean the eyeglasses part, or maybe the sunglasses that you would wear in the, in the sun. They started out as a monocle, or a lens that you might look through if you wanted to look at the sun or if you wanted to see print more clearly because your eyes were fading. And over time, those turned from a lens on the table to a lens on a chain to glasses on a stick, opera glasses. And opera glasses were like, okay, you could go to the opera and hold them up to your eyes and see things better, but your arm would get tired and you'd put them down and then you were sort of back to poor sight. And once people figured out how to make eyeglasses light enough and the vision clear enough that they could be worn on the nose, you could start to have an immersive experience with them, where I can wear these glasses all day long and they help me see better. But I don't think that they're there. I stop thinking about the fact that I'm wearing glasses. By bringing things closer and making them more intimate, they can start to disappear. And I think that that's the opportunity for wearables and why, even though there's this paradox of it seeming like the technology is closer, I think the opportunity there is for it actually to disappear when we make it light enough and when we make it transparent enough it can get out of the way so that we can get back to this idea of living in the world and having the world be the experience. So thank you.